This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here at the 3 o'clock block in Honolulu on Think Tech Hawaii. And as usual, on uh, given Tuesdays, make that Wednesdays, we have Energy in America uh, with Lou Pudirisi of ePrink in Washington, D.C., who joins us customarily by Skype. This time, he's going further. He's going to do something different. He's going to talk about uh, actually a very similar topic to the discussion that we had just last hour with uh, Peter Adler and Greg Chun over public participation in a polarized era. Uh, and he's going to talk about exactly what effect do all of these social media organizations have uh, on our society, where everyone can effectively talk to everyone else. Where does that put government? How does that change decision making? How does that change relationships of a, of a country with 300 plus million people? Um, so, very interesting topic. Uh, and here's Lou Pugliarici to tell us about it. Lou, welcome back to the show. Great, great to be here, Jay. So before we get started, uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about you know, this week in Washington, why this is a timely topic. The CEOs of Google, Facebook, Twitter, and various other technology companies, which have really had a kind of, I don't say a free ride, but a kind of golden ride. Everyone loves them. And they have been in the box in Washington under testimony for the way they handle their uh, meet, uh, the way they handle their advertising, whether they're really a good American companies, who, you know, how do they operate? There's a, a lot of the, the sort of glitter off of these companies is starting to wear off. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I want to talk about tonight is uh, this, uh, whether we are experiencing all this populism and, and a division in our society, an era that wasn't that much different than we've experienced, but some time ago. So let's go to the first slide. Okay. Okay. Now you see this slide is called, Are We Experiencing Another Golden Age? Shift. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting about this is if you look at the so called Gilded Age, say the period between 1870 to 1920, 1930, we had this massive shift. Everybody moved off the agricultural uh, land and moved uh, and, and began to uh, congregate in cities. We started factories. The structure of our society changed dramatically. And if you look at what's happening since say, 1960s, 70s to today, we have this massive shift from services and a decline in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So both societies experienced, uh, you know, fears from recent uh, uh, financial crises. Mm -hmm. uh, the gl global trade powers were, we had a lot of growth in global trade during both periods, and it, it generated lots of winners and losers. And the laws and regulations that were good in the sort of pre-industrial age were not very good for the industrial age. Mm -hmm. And many people now feel that actually the laws we have on the books now really are not appropriate for the kind of society that's emerging. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of basic theme that's going on out there. So let's go to the second slide. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the next question is, you know, people forget in the Gilded Age, we had these robber barons and the Rockefellers and if you looked at these hearings on Capitol Hill, you can see that these high-tech companies are starting to take on this patina of the new robber barons. So mm -hmm. vast for, you know, if you go to the Gilded Age, we had vast fortunes amassed by these you know, robber barons, right? And you had electricity and transformative technologies at times reshaped the whole economy. Mm -hmm. And now what's happening today? We have these dominant firms that are emerging, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, you know, and they, they seem to have enormous power. It was a fascinating uh, uh, editorial columnist in the Wall Street Journal today about how not only do they have a lot of power, but their platforms are very anti-competitive. It's hard for other people to come up with websites and, and uh, approaches that don't rest on these platforms. Okay. Next slide. And at the same time, we have what's called an intensely divided blue and red states, right? Traditionally, we consider red to be the conservative Republicans and the blue, let's say, the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the 1888 election and the 2016 election, you can see the same thing happen. We had uh, the Electoral College winner lost the popular vote, right? 
Mm -hmm. There was a rising share of the election was dominated by fat cats, you know, people with lots of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new communications uh, technologies created a lot of sensationalism. They had the telegraph, you finally see later in the 20s, the emergence of radio. Okay, next slide. The other interesting thing about this Gilded Age is... Um, you had a lot of income inequality, and you had scapegoats. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, the Gilded Age and you go back to this period of time, <clears throat> in inequality was peaking. Income inequality, right? Mm -hmm. Immigration was also peaking. Oddly enough, if you go out to 2013 or 2014, you see the same data trend, right? You see inequality peaking, also high immigrants. And immigrants make a, right, a very, you know, easy scapegoat. In both cases, we saw that. So mm -hmm. many in the bottom 90% blame the rapid rise of immigrants who no longer look like them. Mm -hmm. Actually, what's driving these things, these new technologies are causing vast sums of wealth to be amassed among a few people. This actually happened before. That's what, if there's any consolation out of that, we can say, well, at least we know that it happened before. Maybe we can learn from that. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So as I said, this is not the first populist backlash, right? Uh, if you go back to the Gilded Age, we blamed immigrants. Uh, we had protective tariffs, right? Now people are complaining about NAFTA. Um, the globalists were at fault. And there was a big attack on the parties. Actually, the interesting thing about this, people look at the uproar within the Republican Party, but look at the uproar in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. You know, people are calling for, you know, you should see the attacks on Dianne Feinstein from the senator, the 84-year-old senator from California, who's actually quite able. Mm -hmm. They are, the Democrats are coming after full board. They said, what is this old woman running for? She needs to get out of here there. She's part of the, you know, she's part of the problem. <clears throat> the attacks on Nancy Pelosi. So both parties are undergoing this massive turmoil. Yes. Okay, next slide. The other question is, and one of this popular, which is driving this populism, is whether the uh, winner's circle, is what we say, is too small. And if you look at this data here, you can see that on the left side geography, right, so you can see the distressed communities index. So there's an index of stressed communities, right? And you take a look at this uh, slide, this uh, picture of the U.S., and you can see that the distressed communities occur largely in the south uh, east, right? And somewhat in the, you know, always moving towards the southwest, right? Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, there's a, if you it really expand it up, you can see the number of distressed uh, communities in the Hawaiian Islands is pretty small. Yeah, well, actually, it looks and, like and the Big may, Island. May, that may actually describe the fact that your politics are pretty tame. I mean, you don't really have people with the fisticuffs on the floor of the Hawaiian legislature. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you look at the game in the S&P 500, right, 27% mm -hmm. of the game in the 2017 so far, is either Apple's, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, right? It's really concentrated mm -hmm. among a few players. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you can see here, uh, if you look at this data on education, we're just getting killed if we don't have a bachelor's degree. You can't seem to, to, to uh, find a place in society that makes sense for us. For those of us. Mm -hmm. So all of these these trends in society are extremely disruptive, and they create a lot of uh, anger, a lot of fear, and this is what drives populism. Because populism really about the energy of the candidate, the concern. You're not about good public policy, right? All right, let's go to the next slide. So the other thing is that politics now has become a two-front war, think about it, right? So we, we have social issues and we have economic issues. 
Mm-hmm. So if you think about insiders, right? Goldman Sachs is good, right? Globalization works and lead the world. So that's a kind of uh, Republican country club, old line Democrats, you know, that this is the good government people, the people that have the, the sort of the post World War II consensus. This is where they stand, right? But then you have these outside characters like Trump and Bernie Sanders, which is tax the rich, trade is bad, punish Wall Street, and stop nation building. But we also have right, we also have kind of left right on culture war going on at the same time, right? So the left, we have white identity, white, non white identity politics, more immigration, you know, the real issues are LGBT. LGBTQ and race or gun control. And then on the right, we have this white identity politics, right? Less immigration, Second Amendment. So we have, we have society being torn apart, not just the traditional kind of uh, uh, inside outside kind of history, the post World War II consensus and the old one, but this left and right. Mm-hmm. So the, the, these forces are, are creating all this turmoil you see in the electorate. And then finally, my last slide is that the tech sector really is under pressure. And I think they're shocked by it. I think these guys, when they were up on Capitol Hill this week, they couldn't believe these senators were beating them up. <laughs> they were just, you, know, you could just tell they were stunned. Hey, we're the good guy. No, you're not. <laughs> and you can see, so the, you have this rising population, which is questioning size, fairness, consumer welfare. You also have this rising nativism, right? Limiting access to talent, right? Oh, I don't want the H-2B visa or to bring an Indian engineer over. You know, we, we don't need those guys. We can do it here. We have this rising nationalism, right? Challenging security and local contributions. You know, say America first. We don't need the allies. We don't need these people. And then rising protectionism, which is t- quite serious. So I think limiting access, you know, taxing locally, all these things. And if you look at these broad themes and you say, gee, what's, you know, is the country going crazy or can we kind of get a, grab an anchor here on these big trends and maybe take some solace that we got through the last major, major shift in society and we came out the other end pretty well. And so we need kind of really good leadership now to do that again. So that is exactly where I wanted to uh, start the conversation tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, my, my reaction when you began presenting is that would we be having this conversation were it not for, uh, you know, the your r- remarkable issues around the Russians trying to and effectively, uh, <clears throat> you know, controlling or manipulating the vote in the United States using social media? Uh, you know, I think it was happening, mind you, but it, it wasn't coming to the attention of the press or the public that this sort of thing was possible, that you could have a foreign country, a foreign power, uh, who can somehow manipulate American voting patterns. Um, but what's and, and interesting so, about that whole debate yeah. is that the Russians spent like, I don't know, $150,000, much of it after the election. The actual uh, content analysis suggests before the election, they were stirring the pot on Hillary, and after the election, they were stirring the pot on, uh, you know, Trump. But I don't quite understand. You're telling me for $150,000 they completely disrupted the U.S. election when both candidates spent hundreds of millions of dollars, a lot of it on social media, before, during the election. So are the Russians that much better than the two candidates? I mean, that's the real shocker to me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a low number. Um, yeah. we, we don't have confirmation of exactly what the number was. We may they know only the top of the iceberg on this. They clearly did not have outspend the Clinton-Trump campaign. I yeah. can assure you that. But, but it all suggests that, uh, that you can use social media in a very highly leveraged way. Yes, uh, If yes, you're smart about that it, you spend less. It's possible. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, it, it, of course, it comes up in a political context when you're talking about the Russians trying to, you know, uh, rearrange the vote. But that's that's only part of the story. Um, in fact, our, our our communications among ourselves, I mean, as as citizens of the country and the world, 
are different now, all in the last 10 years, if that, um, that, you, you, that you, Lou, you can reach the world. I mean, it was a dream come true when this first emerged in social media. If you say the right thing and put it out in, a, in the right way, you can be heard around the world and immediately too. This changes the whole paradigm. It changes the this, way human beings program, communicate. It's unthinkable 15 years ago, probably 10 years ago, yeah. that someone in Washington could broadcast in Hawaii yeah. in real time on a very low cost platform. Yeah, you're talking about think tech, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, think about, you know, I mean, I remember uh, when uh, Barack Obama was first elected, the first term, he, he wrote a little piece, which I saw in the, in the, uh, in the European Par Paris um, Herald Tribune, which I, struck me as memorable. It said, query, do we need the Electoral College anymore? Because you can have people voting and get a faithful, uh, assuming there's no hacking, a faithful vote of everyone in the country um, and uh, you, don't, you don't need to have an intermediary step like the Electoral College. Now you can debate that one way or the other, but the fact is that the way people express themselves has changed and anybody can express himself about anything to everybody right, and it right. marginalizes well, government. Let me just make one comment on the Electoral College. It's true that if we went to full representative uh, voting, um, nobody, nobody would campaign in the middle of the country. All the votes are on the coast. Yeah, that's true. Is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know. Well, they, saying, they would send that was social one of the media. ideas of the founding fathers. You know, you're supposed to see everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, the the world of the founding fathers, as you pointed out, is is old. It's it's past, and there's basic fundamental principles of the human human interactivity um, have changed, and all dramatically so in the last few years. And so, uh, have we really kept up with that? And and our form of government, I hate to use a term like that because, you know, we're all trained and raised around the U.S. Constitution as the best, um, you know, social compact document in the world ever. Um, but the reality is that um, it's, it's different now and it's been eroded in the last few months anyway, maybe longer. Uh, and this new way of communication has changed the country so as to change, as you said, the method of laws and the substance of laws uh, more quickly than ever before. And have we kept up with that? In fact, let me ask you this. How, can we keep up with it? Is there anything we can do? I think, you know, I'm pretty sure the, you know, our, our electoral or, you know, our elected leaders, our communities, our thought leaders had many of these same views in the Gilded Age. I'm sure they did if you look at the readings, you know. Actually, at the turn of the century, most analysts thought that the U.S. had reached a technological level that could not be surpassed ever. You know, have you have the emergence of these industrial facilities, uh, power ships, I think uh, the, finally the telegraph, the whole, many, many very intelligent people in society said, look, this is it. It's, we are never going to surpass this level again. We have now reached the pinnacle. So these things are, you know, this isn't the first time. And it was extremely disruptive to society. Mm -hmm. And this, I believe, is extremely disruptive. Oh, I certainly and agree. I just was shocked that the Congress brought these CEOs here. And they, I mean, they really beat them up over the last day or so. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> what was, well, what was their response? I mean, <laughs> a hearing was yesterday and the day before, I believe. There were two sets of hearings. I'll, I'll go check. I can send you the links to them. But you know what, the thing is that uh, they're, they're young, they're vital, they're energetic, right. they're, they're wealthy, they're, you know, they're the leverage they have wealthy. in the technology has been just huge. Uh, they are, as you say, they're the leaders uh, economically, they, they form a good part of the wealth in the stock market. Um, they have tremendous, potentially and really, they have huge power. Do they, they deserve that power. power? Do they know about human affairs to the point where they should be entrusted with that power? You know, they originally thought that they didn't even have to deal with government. Now, they've all hired very large lobbying staffs <laughs> yeah. and government communications people. It's quite interesting. 
they're learning very quickly that they're in a very precarious position vis-a-vis -vis their role to government and the government's interest in looking at new ways to regulate them, new legal structures in which they will interact with other companies and the public. Well, is that, is that going to be a statement going back? I mean, regulate them, limit them, contain them, you know, clip their wings? I don't know, you know, what the new... I think there probably is a common sense set of legal, you know, frameworks that we need to think about, particularly, you know, do people have to disclose who they are when they advertise, particularly political advertising? Should there be some uh, reporting when foreigners... Foreign governments uh, are advertising on, or providing, uh, you know, content that's directly related to U.S. elections. Should there at least be disclosed? I think they're real issues. I don't know what the answer is, but I do think we ought to have this conversation. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, in China they do control the internet and, and other countries too, yeah. I suppose. And we we laughed at that. We said, "Gee, that's not first yeah. amendment. You have to allow the free flow." I said it. The free flow of information on the internet is all about the freedom of the internet. And yet, you know, we have, we have come into a time when maybe that freedom can be destructive and maybe it does have to be regulated by somebody. But query, is government able to regulate? Does government understand I think that's it? an excellent question. And maybe, you know, the intelligent way to think about this is to have more disclosure of who placed the ads. I mean, I think there has to be, or maybe, you know, you could have... Uh, you know, uh, community groups or other outside groups uh, provide information on what's happening. It'd be very interesting for these guys to, you know, publish their revenue and the country of sources. I think what they're going to be seeing is a lot more disclosure mm -hmm. and, which is very important, I think, a framework to allow more competitors in the system. Because there is a view that Google and Facebook they kind of control these platforms, and they've set up a system that makes it very difficult for new competitors yes. to enter. Yes. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like the antitrust movement in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. Exactly. I'm telling you, the parallels are all there. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we, we uh, you know, have to control these big capital concentrations, and this is what's happened because they're too powerful. And it's not right. just that they might try to affect our our uh, thinking, but they can they can affect our thinking without even without even trying. What I mean is exactly exactly yeah. I mean it's very scary. And uh, yeah. the the other thing is, let me ask you this. This is a, a very provocative thought too. Is Lou maybe the genie is out of the bottle? You know, you could stop Google. You could regulate uh, Amazon. Um, you know, you could pull the rug out uh, from from under uh, what's the third one you mentioned, uh, Facebook, yes. um, and maybe that'll happen. <laughs> but you know, can you stop them? Because the internet still essentially is free. So if you limit them, are you going to be able to, you know, limit the whole thing? I think thing? it's a mistake to limit anybody. Okay, and as long as they're not burning down buildings or something. I mean, I think you know to eliminate to to curtail speech and the flow of ideas is probably always a bad idea. But the question is, and so as an economist, I say, I mean, the real problem here is not trying to limit someone, but to make sure the system is opened up for more competitors, mm -hmm. more disclosure, mm -hmm. more transparency, mm -hmm. not less. The well, government is likely to be very ham-handed. I agree with you. Let me, let me take a, the other side of that for a minute. You know, terrorists use the internet. And, uh, and people who violate the law, in general, use the internet. It's a great tool for them. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old days, uh, a spy would leave a little folded piece of paper in a park bench in the shadow of the Washington Monument, and that's how he communicated to another spy. Now, you know, no such problem. I mean, you can communicate all day long and all night long with encrypted messages on the internet. Um, the, world, the world is completely strapped together. And one of the, one of the aspects of that is that it's... Um, you know, it's uh, it's all incognito. You can go on a handle. You can you don't have to identify yourself in any way, uh, except to the people you know who you're communicating with. And and what what is, in fact you don't have to con, you don't have to identify yourself to them either. It's totally anonymous. And you know, I'm wondering in in, the, in this new 1984 world that you're that you're talking about, 
when, when the government starts to regulate these things, which I think I agree with you will happen, um, in this new world, um, maybe one element is you can't use it unless you identify yourself. You can't go well, anonymous. Well, that's a very interesting idea. I kind of like that. Maybe every time someone posts something, there has to be a picture of them. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it talks about as a national identity card or a, right. an international <laughs> identity card. And if, if my number is 6SJ7, then I have to use that or it's a felony and they'll come and get me. Um, Maybe the, everyone should be issued their email address at birth. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like that now. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I think uh, I think what's happened uh, in in the Russian thing has sort of opened our eyes to this, and I don't think we can close them anymore. And uh, Congress has really found something that's worth talking about. Oh boy, have they! <laughs> yeah. So what what's your advice? I mean, how do we how do we fix this, Lou? Have you got any ideas early on about? I actually uh, think we the first thing we need to do is uh, these guys have to sort of come forward and be exposed to the light of day, and everyone's, and, and they, they can no longer have a privileged position different from other companies and other main influential thought leaders in our society. They don't get a pass anymore. I think that's the first step. And that's what happened this week in Washington. I don't think the rest of the country really understands this. To haul these big guys up in front of Congress and really sort of pistol whip them yeah. for a whole day. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a big deal. Yeah. Because yeah. they're not used to that. Yeah. No, they've been getting away with it for years. Yeah. And then now that's we're comfortable. That's what it feels like to be an oil company, but yeah. not Facebook. <laughs> yeah, right. It's what it is. It's the new oil. <laughs> exactly. That's what you have to see. <laughs> Changing our society. And the, the question I'm left with, uh, to, to you know, give you my last thought about it, uh, <laughs> is that, um, you know, okay, good. Congress uh, can do this, uh, but, uh, but it has to be done in a way that's... Uh, that's uh, for the common good. It can't be political. And Congress right now is not in a, Congress right. is very political. And so if, if Congress is going to do this right and regulate them and put you know, l uh, limits on them, Congress really uh, cannot do it. Uh, uh, I, I do think we need a kind of new way of maybe, not necessarily a think tank, but we need a group of really thoughtful people to start talking about this, writing about it, offering common sense strategies going forward because the internet and the progress of technology is potentially a huge, it is a huge boom to society. It hasn't reached everybody, but it can. And it, and it will eventually benefit not just people who went to college, but everybody in the, yeah. in the society. Yeah. It already benefits lots of people. But so I, I think one of the things, it just needs to be exposed it needs to get a big light. People need to start talking about it, writing about it, doing research on it, and saying, "Okay, here's you know here's what the problem is. Here are, here are some ideas going forward, and and this is the conversation society needs to start." Yes, having. including what government should do, of course. Including what government should do and what government should not do. Yes, because most of the times when government does something, it doesn't come out too good. Yeah, not these <laughs> days anyway. But one thing is clear, Lou. It's the end of innocence, the end of the age of innocence about the internet. Uh, I have, couldn't agree more. <laughs> we have crossed the Rubicon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Lou Pugliarisi, for this very special and important and provocative discussion. Uh, really wonderful to open these issues up, and I hope the conversation can continue with you and me and everyone around us. Great. Thank you, Jay. Talk to you in two weeks. Thank you, Lou. Absolutely.